verse 17. So this is Genesis chapter 8, verse 17. And in Hebrew it says, Kol hachaya asher itcha mikol basa ba'of v'bahema v'chol haremes haromes al ha'aretz haftse itach. All the animals which are with you and from all flesh among the birds and among the beasts like livestock and among that which crawls the crawling thing, sorry, the crawler. <laughs> really, Remes, crawler, right? So this is a segment, in case you're wondering. Just like we get Hebrew Melech from Malach, so king comes to reign, here you get Remes from Ramas. The thing that Ramas is, the thing that crawls is a crawler, right? So from among all the crawlers, which crawl, so the Ha, it means which in Torah Hebrew. We didn't, they don't have She in those days. Al Ha'ar, it's upon the earth. Havseh. Bring them out, Itach, with you. And there's actually... Well, look, look, okay, let me think if I want to talk about that or not. I think that this demonstrates Hashem's will that people be active participants in Tikkun Olam. So we have a hefil verb here. So here it's saying it's from Hebrew Yatsa, to go out. But it's the causative form. He feel is a causative form. So it's saying, cause them to come out. Bring them out, in other words. <laughs> it's, <coughs> it's interesting. Noah is being given this responsibility. Bring them out so that they can flourish. We're going to see that Hashem gives the same command. He reaffirms the command from Genesis, early on in Genesis, chapter 1, the piru, piru uivu, be fruitful and multiply to the creatures so that they will be confident and invigorated and unafraid as they go out. And so I think this teaches us, or it alludes to the concept of what we call in Hebrew, tikkun olam, fixing of the world, really is what it means, like the, the restoration, but literally fixing, fixing, a fixing, fixing the world, where we as humans are supposed to be willing participants in the restoration of the world. Remember, Four Torah portions back, I think, I talked about the concept of being a gardener for God. Right? In the sense that the earth was supposed to be Gan Edan. But instead, for many, it's a hell. Not just for the humans, but also for the animals. And so it's incumbent on us as his imagers, since we are Hebrew Tselem Elohim, imagers of God. That is, we have the role of Tselem, just like Melech I mentioned before is from Hebrew Malach. A king is from the, the word to rule. A Tselem is from Tselam. An imager is from the word to image. So that means we're supposed to help other humans. We're supposed to help other animals. We're supposed to reduce suffering. We're supposed to do what we can to make it our responsibility to make this a better world to live in. Could you imagine if every human with means had this concept? In a way, it's analogous to do to others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Or as Hillel says, don't do to anyone else what is hateful to you. But we extend it beyond even humanity to the animal kingdom. And so it seems like, to me, this is what it made me think of. It seems that God is giving this hint to Noah that we are to be the gardeners again. We're supposed to work at least to get back to that level of being the gardeners of paradise by making the earth a paradise again. <coughs> there's, there's something that's worth mentioning here. You see how this is spelled? See how we have a vav here? I'll, I'll colorize it. See, I made it yellow. Maybe yellow was the wrong color choice, but... So, many of the rabbis comment on that. We should read this as if it's a yod. And uh, and then, you know, Rashi and you know, Ibn Ezra and Chizkuni and, you know, a whole lot of them, uh, they get into this. To them, it seems super important that it's a vav instead of a yod and that in the Psalms we see it as a yod and, you know... 
I'm just mentioning it because there's so much comment on it. I don't find it that interesting, <laughs> but it's there in case one of you wants to follow that rabbit trail to see where it goes. Dr. Devera says Genesis 8.17 is a repetition of the command on Genesis. Thank you. Yeah, I only remember it was chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Thank you, Doc. Right. It's God's reaffirming it. Uh, one, one of the sages comments that God's repeating this commandment to the animals so that they will feel secure, that it's safe now. Things are safe. Yehoshua says to some Jews, Hebrew tikkun olam sounds like a call for social activism and hence easy to justify the post-modern politics of, quote, social justice, unquote. I think that is a huge stretch. Tikkun olam for me is a fix of my olam. And as everyone does this to their olam, the world becomes a better place. What do you think? Uh, okay, I agree with you wholeheartedly how the liberal Judaisms have run off wild with this as social justice. That is not the correct <laughs> take on this. I also agree that it's about fixing your own house as well, right? But I think it's possible to do two things at once, right? So I totally disagree with the social justice aspect, so I'm on your side with this. And I agree with what you say about fixing your own. Like, a lot of times we say, it kind of has this double meaning, right? Because you are part of the olam, aren't you? Right? So if you're, if you're doing tikkun, if you're fixing the world, this can also be work on yourself. So this is useful. You guys might hear someone say, oh, I'm doing my tikkun, right? So someone, they're working on improving their Hebrew midot, their character traits. That is also part of tikkun. But I think it's a mistake to become overly self-involved, for example, and only work on our own tikkun, right? Part of working on ourself is interacting with humanity, right? Like, if we're just stockpiling what we have, for example, for our own projects, we're going to do this and this, and we're going to do this for the kids, and we're going to do this for the yard or whatever, and we're going to and we're going to learn 20 million, 20 languages. And this is going. By the way, it's not about anybody in particular. This is just I'm generalizing. So I'm not talking about any of you. If you think it's about you, it's not. Focusing on totally on self, on self improvement only, in the absence or in the vacuum of the world that surrounds us. It doesn't really, it's, it's an artificial improvement, I think. And so, working on ourselves, on our own tikkun, must also involve the world around us. Otherwise, it's an artificial tikkun. You'll excuse me if I quote the song of a dead musician. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Ow! <laughs> I can't do his voice, but... Anyway, but there's something to that, right? You, you make a change in yourself that does help the world, right? So I think maybe what you might be reacting to is a little bit of the psychologist Jordan Peterson's perspective that fix your own, get your own house in order first before you tell other people how to do theirs. But that's really not what I'm saying for Tikkun. I agree with you. The social justice stuff is nonsense. Instead, I would say part of fixing your own house also involves fixing the world around you in that you are being generous to the world around you. You are giving of your time. You're giving of your 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 life. You're giving of your resources. You're giving of your money, etc., to help the world around you to be fixed. Not getting into the social justice stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, there's balance. Yehoshua comments further on that. Uh, about what he considers to be his own olam. Yeah, of course. Well, there's balance in everything, right? I mean, you know, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, but if someone gives 90% of their income and their own family starves, what good is that? Right? Right? <laughs> or, or if they don't have time for their children because they're spending all their time at the soup kitchen helping the poor and the homeless... And their own children end up becoming drug addicts because no attention from daddy or mommy. Or what, yeah, what good is that? But there's balance. There's balance. We've oft mentioned, uh, Lester and Daniel and I used to love to talk about this, this one proverb, this one Hebrew mashal that says, uh, do not try to be too righteous. And it's a very interesting and enigmatic proverb. You could talk about it for hours. right? What does it mean? Don't try to be too righteous. Right. Some say it means don't be pretensive, like pretending that you're so great, right, for others. Right? I think on a certain level it's about balance. About balance. If you're keeping Torah, some people they like to do 
Hebrew Hasidut, which is what the Hasidim do, right? They add to the Torah, basically. They make it much more, it's like an overachiever mentality. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? So they, they basically see that God gives certain types of commandments. And so they speculate, well, if he likes that, he probably would like it if I do this also, right? But there's a limit for some people. Not everybody can do that. That's not for everyone. So I totally agree. Balance is part of tikkun. Okay, Yosha says, so de facto it would be impossible to focus on all of those circles with the same focus. Um, maybe, you, uh, I'm not really sure what you're trying to say there. All I'm saying is you don't ignore any of the circles that God puts in our life, right? We don't ignore it. We do what we can. None of us are perfect, right? It's a good idea to have a weekly realignment, maybe on the first day of the week, where we look at ourselves, how did I do last week for being a member, for being an imager of God? Am I being a good gardener? Am I only focusing on my own family? Yeshua warns us about this. Even evil people love their children, right? <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's so funny. The world you'll see in TV shows or movies, you know, I, I, I watched this uh, series one time called The Sopranos, right? About this, I'm not recommending it, but it's about this mafia guy, you know. And when he's talking to a psychologist, he says, I'm a good guy. You know, he's a murderer, right? <laughs> it's like they, they, they think they're good because they love their children, basically. No, that's embedded in us. <laughs> I mean, a, a, a cobra loves its children, theoretically, cares for its children <laughs> on some level. So it can't, when we're just doing stuff for our own family, that really means we're doing it for ourselves. Right? If it's just about our own family, we're doing it for ourselves. It's an extension of ourself. And so that, I think, is the real danger. I don't think most people are so giving and so helping and so volunteering and so, you know, out there doing world missions or whatever that they neglect their family. I don't think this is usually the big problem. I think I think I need to restate what you're stating, okay? I think usually the problem is the opposite. They're so self-involved, which means they only care about their own family most of the time. They're only helping their own family. They only <laughs> that they neglect tikkun of anything else but themselves because the family is oneself. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then here we get an interesting statement. God goes on to say, The Sharetsu the Aretz, Ufaru the Ravu al Haaretz. The Sharetsu and swarm. Like, they shall swarm, swarm. So Kimchi comments the reason why this time God uses the word Hebrew Sharetz, previously applied to the multiple births. By fish is because this time only a very few of each species is left, has left the ark so that they needed the encouragement by being told they would once more be very numerous, which leads into the next repetition of the command. <coughs> <coughs> Dr. Heiser comments in his book, Supernatural, what the Bible teaches about the unseen world and why it matters, God's original plan was to make the whole earth like Eden. God wanted humans to participate in expanding his good rule over all the earth as it was in Eden. He told Adam and Eve to have children and become lords and stewards of creation. Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28. That command wasn't forgotten after the fall. In fact, it was repeated after the awful events of the flood. Here we are, now having it repeated. Genesis 8, verse 17. Though Eden was lost, God intends that it be restored. I don't know why that happened there. Restored. <laughs> Ultimately, his rule, his kingdom, will return in its full scope when Yeshua comes back and God creates a new heaven and earth. One that, in Revelation 21 and 22, looks a lot like Eden. In the meantime, we can spread the truth of God and the gospel of Yeshua everywhere. We can also represent God to everyone we meet and in every place. I don't think Kaiser realizes he's talking about tikkun, tikkun olam. We are God's agents to restore Eden in the here and now, looking forward to the day when Yeshua brings that plan to a climax. The outward focus, I think is very important. We find when we focus more on other people's needs, we change for the better. Not to neglect our own. Again, balance, balance. All right. So I don't want to spend too much time in 
the Hebrew of the Torah portion here today because I, I have this goal to keep the Joshot a certain length for you guys so it's manageable and digestible. Remember, throughout the week, I'll be having the premieres on YouTube where you can come and you can watch part one, part two, part three. <coughs> and you can hop in on the comments. This is in Torah space PH. That's the name of the channel on YouTube. So continue on with chapter 8, verse 18. Noach uvanai ve'ishto vanaiv ito. So Noach and his sons... So, okay, actually it says, so Noah went out. We actually have the interesting, we have the etnachta there. I didn't notice that before. Let's, uh, look at this. You guys see that, the little wishbone? Here it is, you see? Etnachta, atnach, there's so many ways to call it. This is like a semicolon in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew. It, so that's a thought by itself. Then Noah went out. Okay, and now we continue and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Kimchi comments that the fact that the Torah in this verse separates the females from the males may hint that the females were afraid to leave the ark until after the males had left and assured themselves and them that it was possible again to live outside the ark. I think that makes some sense. Verse 19, Hebrew, kol ha-chaya, kol ha-remes, v'chol ha-of, kol romes, al ha-aretz. All the animals, everything that's, every slitherer, <laughs> every creeper, and all of the birds, everything which crawls upon the earth. See our etmachta there? La mishpechol tehem. Lam, it sometimes can mean like according to, it can function like a kaf sometimes. So probably here, according to their mishpachot, their families, yatz umin hateva, they exited from the ark. Now this word mishpachot, you know, abarmanal, oh, I'm sorry, interesting. Okay, I didn't mark where the blue is, sorry. So I have a comment here. I didn't attach it to a Hebrew word. They were still reluctant to beget children. So this is the women, fearing that there would be another flood. This is Abarmanel, the Karashik translation, commenting why the women came out after. Okay, so then here, let's look at the Mishpachot. This is from my book, Genesis, Look Again. I comment that family, clan, extended family hardly seems appropriate for animal variety. So genus, I think that's how I translate it, my translation. Genus seems to fit the bill for what is meant here by extended family. Interesting. The animation is not complete. I'm not sure what PowerPoint's thinking about. That says chapter 9, verse 9. Va'ani, hineni mekim et briti itchem. And I myself, behold, I will raise up my covenant with you all. Ve'et za'achem, achachem. And also your children, literally your seed after you all. Genesis chapter 9, verse 10. In the Hebrew it says, Let kol nefesh ha-chaya asher itchem, ba-of, ba-behema, u-v'chol chayat ha-aretz itchem. Pardon me, itchem. And also, all life, literally nefesh, all animal life, which is with you, among the bird, among the beast, and among the animals of the earth who are with you. From everything which exits the ark to all animals of the world. Genesis chapter 9 verse 11, the Hebrew says, V'haki moti et briti itichem, v'lo yikaret kol basar od mimei hamabul. This word here, mabul, this is that very significant word. It means flood, but it's not like the usual Hebrew word we use for flood. 
Usually we say Shetef, Hebrew Shetef, which means a flood, right? Like you might have a, there's too much rainfall and you got a flood. But the Mabul is the flood. The word itself doesn't really mean anything about flooding, but it's come to mean the flood. Hamabul, the one flood event, the deluge. Is everybody still with me? Please somebody write something. Velo yihye od mabul, and there will never be again a destructive flood event, the shachet, to destroy or to ruin ha'aretz, the earth. Genesis chapter 9, verse 12. And sit tight. This is the last slide we're going to do with the Hebrew for the Torah portion today. Chapter 9, verse 12, it says in the Hebrew, Vayomer Elohim. Then God said, Zot, Ot, Habarit. This is the sign of the covenant. Asher ani noten, which I will give, or which I am giving, Beini, between me, Ovenechem, and you all. And between every living animal which is with you all. Forever, literally. Literally, it says for generations of eternity. Verse 13 in the Hebrew says, My bow I have given, or I have placed, probably placed. Natan, this is from Hebrew, Natan. Most people learn it, they gloss it as to give, but it also means to set it a place. I have set in the cloud. Right, so here, this is supposed to be collectively. You could say among the clouds. The hayata le'ot berit beini uvein ha'aretz. And it will be for a sign of covenant between me and the world. Verse 14, v'haya be'ani Anan al ha'aretz v'nirata ha'keshet be'anan, and it will be among the clouds of cloud. Is literally what it says, right? So, any place among the clouds, we might see it over the earth, and it shall be seen. What shall be seen? The bow, and the bow shall be seen among the cloud. Literally, it says among the clouds. <coughs> 